So, hello everybody, it is good to see you. This is the final Wolfson Guest Lecture of our series, Health, Environment and Architecture, Discourses from the Past, Challenges for the Present, Perspectives for the Future. On behalf of the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sarah Honamant Ebrahimi, who is an Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellow at the Art History Institute of the University of Frankfurt in Germany and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. After completing her PhD at University College Dublin, she held positions in Ireland, the UK and Finland. She has received funding from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the Irish, Re Irish Re Research Council, the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, and the University of Tampere in Finland, among others. And Tampere is the place where she's based right now, as we have just found out. Her research explores the history of the relationship between people and buildings in the making of imperial and international orders of the 19th and 20th centuries, with an emphasis on the design of hospitals. Among her wide-ranging publications, I would like to mention not only her monograph, Emotion, Mission, Architecture, Building Hospitals in Persia and British India, 1865 to 1914, published by Edinburgh University Press in 2022, but also her edited special issue of the journal Emotions, History, Culture, Society, focusing on architecture and emotions through space and place, also published in 2022. Together with Padma Maitland, she's currently writing a book entitled Feeling Modern European Imperial Architecture for the Histories of Emotions and the Census Series, published by Cambridge University Press. The title of her guest lecture today is The Results Freed Us from Some of Our Western Assumptions About How a Hospital Ought to Be, Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi, and Hospital Architecture in the Mid-20th Century. Sarah, we are happy to have you with us today, and we are really looking forward to your paper. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. It's great to be here. Of course, it would be great if you, I could meet all of you in person, but it's great to be able to share this part of my current project. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully everything is going to work. Is it OK? Yes. Before I start, I just want to mention that I'm going to pronounce certain words in Farsi, including Agahan, and I will provide uh, translation wherever it's necessary. But if you don't understand something, please do ask me after the presentation. In 1969, the Akhan the 14th hereditary imam, which means spiritual and temporal leader of the global Shia um, Ismaili Muslim community, selected a suitable team to design and construct the Akhan University Hospital in Karachi, Pakistan. The team consists of architects, landscape architects, contractors, health consultants, and traditional tile makers. Thomas Payot, the principal of the US-based Payot Associates, and Mojan Khadem, an Iranian-American architect, were among the members of this team. Open the hand for its instructions and Khadem recommendation, Payot and Khadem went on a study trip to Spain, North Africa, Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan to visit several of the major historic sites. Writing about the process by which the team arrived at the design in 1988, Payot stated, the process of discovery was the soul of the design process. The results freed us from some of our Western assumptions about what hospital ought to be. This statement is tantalizing, especially if it's considered alongside Shamash Naji's statement in 1982, that one could almost say the university hospital designed was designed to change meanings of hospital and healthcare in general. Together, these two statements disrupt the historiography of hospital architecture in the 20th century as we know it, which is largely confined to the tropes of revolutionary discourse and modernization ideas and the rise of international liberal international 
organizations. Pious and naughty statements demand searching for other specifically non-Western starting points, worldviews, priorities, and needs. So what I'm going to try to do in this paper is to show how the university, the Khan University Hospital was designed differently from Western models of the period. And I'm going to proceed in this way. I will first provide a very brief historiography of hospital architecture in the 20th century. And then I talk about when the hospital was built, when it was completed, and then I talk about architecture. I'm not going to provide a very detailed description, but I just want to talk about the Arachan vision and show how the hospital was designed differently. And finally, I'm going to reflect on the relationship between the university hospital and ambitions for Pakistan and see how we get. Uh, so I'm going to keep it simple. If we consider the historiography of hospital architecture in the 20th century, it is it goes as follows. Hospitals as a ventilation system, as a medicalized machine, as a therapeutic, attractive, and efficient workplace. And many of you probably know that the ventilation system specifically referred to the pavilion plan hospitals and a medicalized machine referred to high-rise office-like structures that specifically became popular from the 1930s onwards. By the mid-20th century, they were considered as unattractive and unpleasant, and they were being replaced by low-rise structures, and they uh, how, to host, how to build a therapeutic, attractive, and efficient workplace became the defining question. And these ideas at the same time were being circulated in first in imperial territories and then in newly found um, nation states through, for example, Florence Nightingale Note on Hospitals, British Army, inter imperial flow of architectural exchange and expertise, and later on through liberal international organizations such as Hospital International Hospital Federation, which was founded in the US in 1920. Nine and the UK-based Nofield Foundation, which was founded in 1949, and of course, architects such as Paul Nelson. But this picture only holds true if we consider modern hospital movement only a product of the Enlightenment project of Victoria of Science, Philosophy, and Technology, and of liberal international discourse of great men. Moreover, to focus only on Florence Nightingale or British Army or International Hospital Federation and Nuffield Foundation is to overemphasize the importance and reach of this establishment, to assume that there is a pure or authentic form of internationalism or board making, and does in the process dismiss those groups and projects who had fewer members or were short-lived. There is little to no research on hospital architecture and provision and socialist, Christian, and Islamic internationalisms or world making. The activities of the organizations, such as the International Catholic Confederation of Hospitals, which was active in East Asia, East Africa, and the Middle East, and cooperated with the International Hospital Federation, are completely unknown as are the activities of the Afghan, the fourth and the Ismaili global community. Not only we don't know how we got here, to use on Maria Adams' phrasing, but we also are unclear on what that here actually is. And this brings me to the Afghan University Hospital. So the Afghan, the fourth, became the imam of the global Ismaili community succeeding his grandfather Al Khan the third in July 1957. In 1963, he discussed the possibility of setting up the Anaha Khan Hospital in Karachi, and a year later, he officially announced his decision. It took three years to obtain a suitable land, which was donated by the president of Pakistan, and then uh, two years later, they obtained tax exemption 
And in 1970, they selected a suitable team and the foundation of the hospital was, uh, was laid in 1971. So the School of Nursing was opened in 1981. And here you can see the opening ceremony. And the hospital was opened in 1985. It was built off Stadium Road to the east of Karachi and it comprises, comprises of 721 bed hospital, a community clinic, a medical school, school of nursing, housing for male and female students, and a mosque. And the hospital has been expanded since. Rather than being a freestanding high-rise structure, or an object building, the university hospital is consists of several interconnected low-rise structures of no more, no higher than three floors. Only the private wing is a four-story building. And that is what I want you to bear in mind that it is consists of several interconnected low-rise structures. And this brings me to the architecture of the hospital. Despite Mildred Schmidt's claim in an article for architectural record in 1987, the university hospital was not different from conventional Western models for having a low rise design. And as I already mentioned, low rise hospitals were not a product of the 1970s. They became more popular in the 1970s and 1980s, but they were being built since the mid 20th century. Moreover, if we situate the design of the hospital in the context of the mid 20th century discussions concerning hospital provision design in developing countries of the third world, it becomes clear that nothing was special about building a low rise hospital. And another example, it's this hospital which was built in South Vietnam. It was featured in the World Hospitals, which is the official journal of Inter International Hospital Federation in 1973. Hayat wrote that although a great deal of attention has been given to our horizontal design, the issue we confronted was not whether this would be a vertical or horizontal solution, but how to design a healthcare facility, facility that expressed the concern about the people using the building. However, the hospital was not different for catering to the specific local requirements either. If we consider articles that were published in the World Hospitals, we realize that drawing inspiration from the history of the institutions of economically advanced countries was not recommended. And this was emphasized in several articles that were published in the World Hospital, Hospitals in the, 19, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So what is different about this hospital? To understand how the university hospital was different, we need to go beyond a preliminary reading of uh, Schmidt's or Payot accounts or other accounts of the hospital. Failure to do so might lead to the conclusion that the university hospital was merely a hybrid structure that catered for the everyday life of the users. After all, an article labeled the hospital indigenous high tech. But taking this label at face value comes at the cost of concealing the Hanford vision. Like many Muslim intellectuals and reformers, the Hanford views Islam and tradition as compatible with modernity and modern science. According to him, Islamic belief recognizes two parts to life, neither of which must be forsaken. Deen, which means refer to faith or spiritual, and dunya, which means to the word or the material. The soul is given a physical form and hence far from being the opposite of the spiritual, the fulfillment of one's physical and material responsibilities leads to spiritual happiness. He not only encourages his jamaat or his followers to follow his guidance in this regard, but also sees it as his own responsibility against the background of Christian religion tradition to cater for both spiritual well-being 
and material progress of his people. Rather than arguing that his total progress can be achieved by setting aside, aside the scientific development of Western nations, he argues that progress for the developing nations should come to mean something different from the one-sided material advancements of the West. The lives of the people in the developing nations can only be truly enriched if the scientific development of Western nation can be married the pharma unique traditions. The direction of this new progress must be such that it orients it, each individual to search for the spiritual fulfillment in his or her life to that ultimate state of reintegration with Allah. In other words, the Ahan the Fourth does not impose a dichotomy between modernity and tradition, nor does he turn away from the future-oriented notion of progress. He rather offers an alternative notion of progress. His demand for the marriage of scientific Western development to a unique tradition of developing nations is not a post-colonial act. That is, the work of inverting and reinscribing colonial ideologies in the service of the post colonies rather than the metropolitan centers. He is inspired by his grandfather, whose conception of God, according to Khalil Andani, differed significantly from Judeo Christian monotheism. To conceptualize their vision, we need to consider the conflict thesis between science and religion. Two 19th century American authors, John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White, are widely recognized for promoting this thesis. However, as Summer Ohak has demonstrated, Draper and White's generalizations did not extend to Islam. The green picture of the history of the Catholic Church sat in sharp contrast with their delineation of Islam rationalism, inventiveness, and great scientific achievements, which made it not just compatible with science, but the religion of science per excellence. There was an awareness of the conflict model among Arab, Arabs and Ottoman journalists, intellectuals, and educated officials before the publication of these books, and although there existed different attitudes, the view that maintained an understanding of the harmony between science and religion gradually became the dominant one, and the publication of these books provided Muslim reformers with a convenient testimony to argue for the superiority of Islam over Christianity. And this is this position that has endured in the Muslim collective imagination ever since, and it's the one that our Hunt III endorsed and our Hunt IV has been advocating. Acknowledging and understanding this position allows to understand the design and planning of the university hospital better. Descriptions of the buildings highlight how they are part of an organic whole and are oriented in bar in contrast to the exterior, the spaces within are courts to delight the senses. There is still running and splashing water on patterned pavements. They also refer to the architect's particular attention, the size of and transition between courts, their use of traditional indigenous principle of environmental control, and development of appropriate Muslim ornament for entire hospital facility and the design with great care of the entrance portals and gates with marble and calligraphic ornamentation comprising Quranic verses. This had been think as, taken as evidence of the hunter towards everyday user for his desire to reevaluate and revive traditional architecture, these descriptions may be taken as indication of his preoccupation with attractiveness and wayfinding in hospital. However, the Ahan IV urged for buildings that would reflect the spirit of Islam, by which he meant buildings that would reflect the value system of Islam in terms of the interrelationship between Deen and dunya, which is the spiritual and the material. In this context, the design of an organic whole 
and a sequence of spaces and the incorporation of water and calligraphic ornamentation were not seen as natural or traditional or attractive per se. They were not meant to denounce modernity either. Rather, they meant to facilitate harmony between Din and Dunya and prevent a shift from one to another. In a speech delivered at Asia Society in New York in 1979, Hunderford echoed this view after referring to the university hospital. Since all that we see and do resonates on the faith, the aesthetics of the environment we build and the quality of the social interactions that take place within those environments reverberates on our spiritual life. For example, entering a building gradually and through a sequence of rooms could facilitate etra al-amul, which means divine awareness including both intellect and perception by com contemplation. So what I'm trying to show is that the hospital is different because it was designed to facilitate the interrelationship between din and dunya or the spiritual and the material. And this brings me to the last part, part of this paper, which is the relationship between the university hospital and ambitions for Pakistan. Alila Andoni poses the question of the practical application of the unity of the din, unity of din and dunya in the light of secularizing forces. According to him, the Ahan, the fourth rejection of total secularization does not mean that he supports the idea of a theocracy or an Islamic state. He goes on to explain that our the fourth solution calls for the creation of a, plural, a pluralistic civil society that is informed by the ethics of faith. And this is this pluralistic civil society is the key term here. His contention, um, Khalil Andani's contention in terms raises the question of what the link between the university hospital and demands for Pakistan is, especially that Aghan IV refers to his grandfather as the founder of the Pak founder of Pakistan, in whose footsteps he hopes to do his best to follow. To address this question, it is essential to recognize the contingencies and contradictions that led to the establishment of Pakistan as a separate nation state and continue to deter determine establishments ever since. They reveal that the word pluralism has a specific genealogy in the Ahan IV thought going back to his grandfather. As the founder and the first president of the All India Muslim League, which was founded in Dhaka in 1906, the Ahan III thoughts about the future of India constituted a plea for pluralism and the idea of the post-national. And taking into account this genealogy will help situate the university hospital better in the context of ambitions for Pakistan. Stuart Leslie has recently published an article that uh, is called North American Architect Building Modern Pakistan, and it talks about the Ahan University Hospital as a university alongside other universities, such as the University of Islamabad, and he situates them in the context of partition of India in 1947. He writes that Pakistan was particularly left with only one medical college, the King Edward Medical College in Lahore. Although new schools were established after partition, they were not enough. And Ahan IV took advantage of these unfortunate circumstances when he decided to establish the Ahan University Hospital. However, Leslie analyzes disregards the idea of Muslim India within India, the absence of a strong separation in sentiments up until the 1930s, the late 1930s, and the Muslim League lake of interest in the inclusion of religion in politics as well as the hunter demand for pluralism and the idea of the post-national. While, while similar to the idea of Muslim India within uh, India, Ahan III demand an idea aimed to transfer Muslim minority status in India. It advocated for distinct and complex grammar of subjectivity. 
This grammar favored of the formation of a collective polity, but not one that led to a strict form of political pan Islamism or resulted in a totalizing or homogenizing meta narrative of territoriality, especially one uh, founded on European models. In putting forward this grammar of uh, the third rework, the very conceptual framework of pan Islamism. And this grammar was the guiding force of his educational and medical campaigns that were consolidated under the Ahan the Fourth leadership. Thus, the instrumentalization of Islam in the 1970s, which witnessed the making of Islam as the state religion of Pakistan for the first time, did not sit comfortably with the Ahan the Fourth vision, nor did the idea of Pakistan as a new Medina or a sovereign Islamic state from where the place of Islam in the modern world could be renewed or raised. Since the 1957, the has stressed pluralistic values in various contexts ranging from intra-faith pluralism among Muslim communities to most recently global pluralism for peace and progress and of course, um, I can't talk about all these different contexts and I'm still myself learning about them. But it is of note that the construction of the university hospital led to the foundation of the Ahan Award for Architecture, which is one of the biggest architectural awards. And one of the purpose, purpose of this award has been to influence the notion of pluralism. As the Ahan the Ford noted in, a, in an interview with Robert Evey, the editor-in-chief of, in chief of Architectural Record in 2001, by bringing different types of projects and different environments and different uh, countries with different architectural traditions and languages, the award has enhanced the notion that pluralism is an asset. Thus, the university hospital can be considered as the first step toward enhancing pluralism through architecture. This point is legible in the Hunterford opening remarks at the seminar one in the series Architecture Transformations in the Islamic World. After explaining how during the design process of the university hospital, a dialogue started that eventually led to the establishment of the, the Hunterford for Architecture, he presented the university hospital only one possible attempt at the problem and not the solution. And this, this is what is important, that he did not present the university hospital as the solution. This is not to say that the design of the university hospital embodies pluralism, but to point out that its very construction worked towards promoting pluralism as a malleable process. I'm going to stop here. Thank you.